In the meantime, we are looking here at what I want to say is page 40, thank you, of your unit handout. This is 20.3.10, conservation of energy. Notice there's a word that's conspicuously missing from that statement or phrase, and it's mechanical. We've already learned about conservation of mechanical energy. Now what I'm going to do is talk about conservation of energy in general. You should understand that conservation of mechanical energy is conservation of energy. It's just conservation of energy if the system is isolated, which means there are no external or outside forces. It doesn't mean if there are forces, we can't still look at conservation of energy. So we're going to be doing a lot of work today. We're going to be studying conservation of mechanical energy again as, a, as an introduction to conservation of energy in general. We are going to be looking at conservation of energy in the most general sense. We're going to be looking at conservation of mechanical energy as a specific type of conservation of energy. And then we're going to be looking at something else which is called the work energy theorem, which can also be thought of as conservation of energy or not, depending on how you approach it, how you imagine what's going on. So to begin with, a review here. Mechanical energy, MGH plus one-half MV squared, that's mechanical energy, right? If I say to you that at one point in time, that's the mechanical energy, and then the mechanical energy at another point in time, if I say they're equal, are we clear that I'm telling you mechanical energy is conserved? I hope it's clear I'm not saying that the MGH on the left and the MGH on the right are the same. They could be, that would be a fluke. Most likely, the MGH on the left and right are different. Maybe the MGH on the right is less than the MGH on the left. But that would mean the kinetic on the right would be more than the kinetic on the left. It balances, right? So what I am asking is, if this is not the case, if they are not equal, it could be because of one of two reasons. And I know you could probably argue that they're the same kind of thing. But I want us to think as if they're kind of two different things. So can somebody come up with why the mechanical energy in a system would not be conserved? Noah? Noah? Right, when there's a force being applied to the system somehow to change the mechanical energy. And by the way, let's get something out of the way right now. Is gravity being applied? Always. We do not consider gravity to be an outside extra force. Right. So one of the reasons why is because work is being done. Now that's not exactly what Noah said. Noah said there's a force being applied. But when you apply a force to an object and the object moves over a distance, then you're doing work. So if work is done, you're adding energy to the system. What is not in here, and I'm just going to put it down somewhere, but when I go to the next page, it will disappear. So if you want to make a note of it, you should probably do so now. Work is change in energy. So when Noah says we're applying a force and we're doing work, that means we're transferring energy into the system. So afterwards, if, if that roller coaster starts at the top and we measure its mechanical energy at the top, and then we measure its mechanical energy, the total kinetic and potential, some other point in time, and it's more, 
then there must have been a little rocket on the back of the car doing work to the car to increase the mechanical energy. Whether it results in the mechanical energy being greater because the car gains kinetic or because it gains potential, because that force is pushing it further uphill than it would normally go, the mechanical energy is increased. I just want to make a note here, everybody, and it's not anything you need to write down. That I'm saying the work done, when work is done, the final mechanical is greater. It could be the final mechanical is less because you're applying a force in the opposite direction. You're doing a negative amount of work. But I think right now at this stage of the game, this is good enough. What's the other situation? I'm, I'm asking you for another situation, but it's really the same kind of situation that would cause mechanical energy to not be conserved. And the hint I will give you is, when work is done, the final mechanical energy is greater, but in the second situation, it results in less mechanical energy at the end. Mark? Right, when there's a force of friction, which is a force, just like you said, and it produces heat energy, well, heat energy has to come from somewhere. It's a form of energy. Where does it come from? The mechanical energy decreases to produce the heat. And this is what we're talking about when we're saying energy is conserved. The total energy would still be conserved. It's just that it's not mechanical. So if there are frictional forces present, then the mechanical energy at the end will be less than it was to begin with because heat is produced. And if I had to edit this document ever so slightly, I would put the word energy right after the word heat. It's heat energy that's produced. Heat is good enough, but I'm just trying to remind you that heat is energy. You know, if I'm going to put force after the word friction, then I ought to put energy after the word heat. So now here's where things get a little cloudy. Because you could certainly argue that this second situation is one of the first situations. That work is being, when friction is applied to a system to reduce its mechanical energy, we could say reduce its mechanical energy by heat produced by the force of friction. We could say that that force of friction is doing work to the system. It's changing the energy of the system. It's just that because the force is backwards, there's a loss of energy. So in both of these, in both of these, you could get away with saying the work done by those forces is the change in the mechanical energy. You could. It's just that the work done by a force applied in the first case since that force is applied in the same direction, the change in energy is positive. It goes up. But since forces of friction are always opposite to direction of motion, the work in the second case is negative, decreasing the mechanical energy. So these are the two cases. So now I'm going to walk through this in a more detailed manner. If there is a force of friction present in a system, then that force is called a non-conservative force, which means, everybody, the system is not isolated. Why is it called a non-conservative force? Because mechanical energy is not conserved. What happens is you will produce heat energy, decreasing the mechanical energy. Even though mechanical energy is not conserved, we can still say energy is conserved. But I, I need to get something out of the way right now. When heat is produced, is the heat... When I run across the gym floor in shorts and I fall to my knees and I allow friction to do work to me to decrease my mechanical energy, is that heat there before I skid to a stop? No. It's a final form of energy. And I know that that, that heat is produced not all in one lump at the end, but it is a final form of energy. 
So energy is still conserved. You just have this statement. You just have that the mechanical energy before is going to be equal to the mechanical energy afterwards plus the heat. And, and this becomes, and I don't know that you need to write this down, but this would become you know, mgh plus a half mv squared before equals mgh after plus a half mv squared after plus heat, heat energy. I, I'm not always going to write the word energy with it. I'm trying to get across to you that heat is a form of energy. It's measured in joules. But, but, so you could certainly add that to your notes, although uh, I hope you're not looking at this like, oh, I better memorize that formula. You're thinking of concepts here. But what, what does the work to produce heat? Work is when you have a force times a displacement. If I say, what is the work done by my puppy in pulling a wagon of dirt across my yard? You have to take the force that my puppy applies to the wagon of dirt and multiply by her displacement or the wagon's displacement. If I say, what is the work done by Peter in lifting an object, then you have to take the force applied by Peter. So if I say, what is the work done by friction? What is the energy produced by friction? In other words, what is the heat? You have to take the force of friction times the displacement. And this formula, everybody, is not on your formula sheet. But you need to know it. Work equals force times displacement is kind of on your formula sheet. Kind of. It's Fd cos theta, but it's there. So if we're asked to determine the work done by friction, which is heat, it's the force of friction times the displacement. That's a long one. It's really locked up this time, isn't it? So if you wrote... There it is, finally. If you wrote this, you could write instead that. But the biggest mistake is people do this. You can't have an equation that has energy plus energy equals energy plus energy plus force. There's apples and oranges there. They don't add up properly. So you could do that. If work is done to a system, then the energy changes by the amount of work done. And this is called the work energy theorem. And I, and I know that we're kind of be, going to be going in circles because many of you could argue that that's what we just talked about with friction. Work is changing the energy in the system. But the work energy theorem says this. I've told you that this is the definition of work, right? This is on your formula sheet. But I don't think of it as a formula. What I think of it as is an idea that the work done is the change in the energy. What is the rule for delta? Always final minus initial. This is force times displacement, right? What if you take the final energy in a system and subtract the initial and you get a positive result? Well, that means that work was done to increase the energy, which would mean the work is positive, which would mean the force is positive, which would mean it's in the same direction as the motion. What if when you subtract these energies, you get negative? Well, that just means that the work done was negative, so the force was in the opposite direction.
If no work is done and no heat is produced, then we are talking about what we learned yesterday. Mechanical energy is conserved. All right. Let's look at some examples. And our job now is to figure out which situation we're talking about. This is all under the guise, everybody, of either the following, one of the following two situations. This, there, I didn't write mechanical, just energy. So heat could be in here. Or this. And again, this is, this is tricky. This general statement of the law of conservation of energy includes conservation of mechanical energy. And if you think of things the right way, it includes the work energy theorem, which is below. But you don't have to do it that way, and many times we don't want to. How much work is done in stopping a 250,000 kilogram train that's traveling at 70 kilometers per hour? Let's do the meters per second thing first. I could never see that from here. Can you tell me? 19.4. And the four is repeating, right? Yeah. Okay. So this is 19.4 meters per second. Now, don't just put your pencils or pens down for a second, whatever you're writing with. See, this is a problem you could have done a week or two ago, a week ago. Because you could have said, and don't write this down, work is force times displacement. The force in this case is going to be the net force because when you look at the train, and I'm not going to draw a choo-choo train, when you look at the object moving in this direction at 19.4 meters per second, the only force, I put a vector symbol above the 4, that's not what I meant to do, just a dash, the only force is whatever that backwards force is, stopping the train. Right? And that's the net force because all the other forces cancel. So then you would have said this must be MA. I guess I need to find MA. And then you would have said, man, now i got to find A. VI is 19.4 meters per second. VF is 0. You know what, I take it back, you couldn't have done this problem. You thought you could have done this problem last week, but then you'd go, I don't have enough information. Turns out, if you made up a distance, you could do it. But you don't know the distance. So this is a dead end. So how is it we determine what the work done is? Well, we use this. Work is change in energy. The work done is the change in energy, which is the final energy minus the initial energy of the train. What kind of energy does the train have to begin with? Kinetic. Kinetic. And at the end, it has no energy which means this is going to be 0 minus 1 half mv squared. So the work done is the negative of 1 half mv squared. And, and I want to do this calculation with you and explain to you why the negative is there. Uh, negative 1 half times, it was 250,000 kilograms times 19.4 repeating meters per second quantity squared. Why the negative? Well, if I just calculate a half mv squared, don't worry about the negative just yet. If I just calculate the half mv squared, I get this amount of energy. Do you get the same number, by the way? Okay. I'm going to unpack that. That's... 
47.3 million joules of kinetic energy, I think. So I just want to make sure you're getting the same number. Okay. So the train has 47 million joules of kinetic energy. Why is the work done negative 47 million? Because the train lost energy. So that negative 4.7 times 10 to the, I suppose it would be 7 joules, when we put it into standard scientific notation, that work is negative because the train lost energy. Where did the energy go? Do you know, Joseph? Heat due to friction. Heat due to friction. Because, you know, when a train is stopping, it's all of those frictional forces involved that's slowing the train down to a stop. Let's take a look at number two. A 15-gram arrow is pulled back 45 centimeters in a bow by exerting an average horizontal force of 65 newtons. When I release it, what will the speed of the arrow be? This is a problem that you could have done before. What you could have done, and don't write this down, is you could have used d equals 0.45 meters. You could have used the force equals ma to determine the acceleration of the arrow as the bow pushes it to the point of release. And you could have used vi equals 0 to find vf and solve the problem. But do you remember me saying yesterday, sometimes work and energy is a way to avoid kinematics, and that's a good thing? Work equals change in energy. The only thing, and it's a subtle thing, is the following. Work is done by something, and change in energy is change in energy of something. What undergoes the change in energy in this question? What will experience a change in energy? The arrow. The arrow. This is of the arrow. What is doing the work? The bow. Bow, string, whatever you want to call it. So this is FD of the bow, and this is EF minus EI of the arrow. Now, there's one final thing here. When I say I apply that force of 65 newtons, that's the force that I apply. But if I apply that force, when I let it go, that's the force that the bow will apply to the arrow. So all we're going to do is say force times distance. Equals, well, Look, is the arrow moving before you let it go? Maybe. Maybe if you're running, holding the bow and arrow, right? But it doesn't mention that you're running when you let it go. So we assume it's something like archery practice where you have a target and you're standing there stationary and you've drawn the, the arrow back in the bow. So that's zero. All we have left is one-half mv squared. How many grams was it? 15 grams, very light arrow, 0 0.015 kilograms. We may never have solved an equation like this before, but it's just math. Right? I need to, well, I, we kind of have. 65 times 0.45 is the work done, times 2 divided by the mass, and then I have to take the square root about 62 meters per second. Which, I don't know if you've ever watched people shoot archery, you can't see the bow move through the air. I don't think. I don't think our perception is that acute. You just, you hear a noise and it's, and it's there in the target, hopefully in the target. 
So that's very fast. That's, um, I want to say, over 200 kilometers per hour times by 3.6. Number three, a two kilogram rock is thrown straight up by exerting an average force of 35 newtons over a vertical distance of one meter. What is the speed that the rock leaves the person's hand at? So work done is the change in energy, and this is by the hand, and this is of the rock. So this is the force times the displacement, and this is EF minus EI. Can we agree that EI is zero? That by any reasonable interpretation, when you have the rock in your hand, you have it here, and you're going to apply this force, accelerating the rock and letting it go one meter later. By any reasonable description of what's going on, the energy of the rock to begin with is nothing. Okay. So we are left with this that the work done is the final energy of the rock. What kind of energy does the rock have at the end of the one meter application of the force? Ever Ray, do you know? What kind of energy, when I do work, I give energy to objects. So what kind of energy am I giving the rock? No? Emerson? I am giving it kinetic energy because I'm accelerating it and it's going to leave my hand with some speed. So this is kinetic energy. Am I also giving it... gravitational potential energy. Yeah, because when I let it go, it's a meter higher than where it was. I'm not talking about the potential energy it's going to have later when it reaches some maximum height. I'm saying if I go from this position where my hand is and there's no potential energy and no kinetic, and I go to this position one meter higher where it's moving and has kinetic, it also has potential. Can I cancel the masses? No. And now we can put in everything. Uh, I keep saying one meter, but I never went back and checked. Is it, in fact, one meter? Yeah. So one meter, I'll leave out the units. One half times the mass. Did I see two kilograms? Yeah. Oh, we're not trying to find the force. We know the force, don't we? Was it 65? 35, 35, okay? So you do 35 joules of work. 35 times 1 is 35 joules of work. We're trying to find the speed, is that right? So you have to solve that equation. You know, I've been talking about this question for maybe five minutes here. That's because that's the physics. We're here to learn physics. Solving this is easy. It's, well, it should be easy at this level. It's basic math. You have to take 35 times 1, subtract 2 times 9.81 times 1, then whatever you get, well, multiply by 2 and divide by 2. If you're wise about it, you'll see the 2 and the half cancel. But anyway, then take the square root. So 35 minus 2 times 9.81. The half and the 2 cancel, so I have to take the square root. So I get 3.9 meters per second. Nothing to do with you guys. I just had a thought, and I had to write it down. Uh, any questions with that example?
Number four, 20 kilogram box slides down the ramp shown from the top. The force due to friction is 55 newtons. What is the speed when it reaches the bottom? I have a question. As the box slides down the ramp, is energy conserved? Which means, I'm asking, is the energy in the system at the top equal to the energy in the system when the box is at the bottom? I didn't ask you if mechanical energy was conserved. I asked you if energy was conserved. The answer is yes. It will have less mechanical energy at the bottom than the top, but it will still, there will still be the same amount of energy in the whole system because there will be heat that is the difference between the two because there's friction. So this is a case of energy at the top. Well, I don't want to say, let me write this out first. This is a case of energy before equals energy after. I don't want to say energy at the top equals energy at the bottom because the heat that's produced is not going to be all clumped at the bottom, right? It's going to be spread out throughout the whole ramp and the box. So what kind of energy does the box have at the top? Well, it has gravitational potential energy. I should do a better job here, and I should have said the box slides down the ramp from the top from rest. What kind of energy is present in the system at the bottom? Well, the box will be moving, and there will be heat. How can we calculate the heat? You can take the force of friction times the distance. And if you want, you can do that now, off on the side, or, and I do have to say in marking your last assignment, as a group, you're getting very, very good at the idea of developing formulas not having to calculate all these little things off on the side and then do the math with them. Can I cancel the masses? No. Again, everybody, students who memorize formulas are not going to be successful in high school physics. Students who rely only on formulas on the formula sheet are not going to be successful. Students who understand physics ideas and are able to develop a formula for a specific situation are the ones who will be successful. It's just a matter of putting in all the numbers now with one little wrinkle. So the mass is 20 kilograms. I hope we're okay with me just writing G. What are we missing? We're missing the height. But that's a Pythagorean theorem situation. So do me a favor, work your magic there, and can see how many of you see it's six meters, by the way, by looking at it. It's a three, four, five triangle. Anyway, we would use the Pythagorean theorem to determine the height. This is equal to one half times the mass, which is 20. We are asked to find the speed at the bottom. This is 55 newtons of frictional force times 10 meters. So when you look at this D that I've just underlined four times, this D is the distance over which the force of friction ask, uh, acts, which is the length of the ramp. But when you look at the MGH, H is a height, which is the height of the ramp. They're different things. Again, solving this is pretty easy. 20 times 9.81 times 6. Subtract whatever 55 times 10 is, which is 550. I'm going to do this, and I, I'm going to ask, is this the final example? Okay. So I'm going to do this and then ask a question. Subtract 550. This is going to be the kinetic energy that's left over at the bottom out of the mechanical. But my question is this, and it's not really that important, but I want to get you guys thinking. What if we did that and we got a negative number? What would that tell you 
about the situation if we subtracted those two things and got a negative number. Do you know, Noah? Uh, well, I mean, you didn't do it right. Or oh, I didn't think of that. Maybe you didn't do it right, yeah? Or a force of five is pushing up the rim. Oh, and I didn't think of that. <laughs> oh. In other words, maybe there was some other force. What if there were no other forces and I haven't done anything wrong? And you got a negative here. Right? Would it not be moving? Yeah, it wouldn't reach the bottom. That force of friction would have stopped at someplace else. Anyway, now I have to multiply by 2 and divide by 20 and take the square root of the answer. So about 7.9 meters per second. See, now I'm starting to think maybe Thursday for your exam is too ambitious. I want to finish this example, and I want to say to you that I, I think we're going to continue practicing this stuff on Monday, which... I have to reevaluate the exam situation and when we're going to have it, but don't worry about it, okay? I'll figure out something that's fair. It might even mean that our final lesson is not on the exam and we do that final lesson after we write the exam when we return. Catch my drift? So there's one more lesson after this one. Maybe we just don't do it and then we write the exam on everything else next Thursday and then learn that final lesson when we return. I'll sort out something that hopefully will please most of you. This is the final example though, is that right? Okay. So 120 Newton forces applied. Stop, full stop. Is work being done? Yeah, I mean as soon as you see a force is being applied, you know work is done. And if work is done, you're gonna use the work energy theorem. which is work equals final energy minus initial energy. And this is the ultimate kind of question because not only is work done, but when you read the question, heat is produced because there's a force of friction. There's a horizontal level surface. We're applying a force to an object. We're applying the force horizontally to the object. I hope everybody sees by now, looking at the information in the question, that we can certainly determine the acceleration. <coughs> because you know VI, VF, and D. I want you to read the question carefully and tell me what kind of energy is in the system before we do the work. Noah. Kinetic. kinetic. It's already moving, two meters per second. There is kinetic energy before. So we are going to have minus one-half mv squared. What kind of energy is present after, which means when the box reaches that speed of 8.5 meters per second, what kind of energy is present in the system? Ethan? Uh, heat energy. Sorry? Heat energy. There's heat because there's friction, right? Is there another kind of energy in the system when it reaches that final speed? Kinetic. Kinetic. And the, the difference here, everybody, I guess I'll write this down first, is that whatever the work done is, if there was no friction, all of the work done would have gone into increasing the kinetic energy of the box. But some of it goes into increasing the kinetic energy and producing heat. 
So as I said, this is the ultimate question because it becomes this. Fd equals the force of friction times the displacement plus a half mv squared minus a half mv squared. You've got work, heat energy, kinetic en energy, and kinetic energy. You don't need to write all of this stuff down that I've got at the bottom. I'm just pointing out there's four players in this. There's the initial and final energy of the box. There's the heat produced during the application of the force. And there's the actual work, which is the energy you put into the system to make all this happen. We are after, if you take a look up here, we are after the force of friction. So we can put in 120 newtons times, did I see 13 meters for the displacement? Equals the force of friction, which we want to know, times 13 meters. Well, this is really interesting. We don't need to use kinematics to find an acceleration to find a force. This is a problem you could have solved with a free body diagram. It's still a difficult problem even without it, plus the half times 9 kilograms times 8.5 squared minus a half times 9 kilograms times 2 squared. And just before we finish this off, everybody, you know, what is this? It's just a number. It's just a number. You can figure out what it is. What is this? It's just a number. This is just a number. You're dealing with an equation that has a whole bunch of numbers and a term that's 13x. From a math standpoint, it's not difficult to solve that. We have to take this 120 times 13, subtract whatever a half times 9 times 8.5 squared is, add whatever a half times 9 times 2 squared is, and then when we're done all that, then we can divide by 13. A lot of numbers there. It's going to serve you well if you get into the habit of checking everything before you hit equals. And if you have your calculator where you type and things run off the screen, tough luck. You're going to have to make sure you enter things carefully. That's why I don't like that mode. You'll make fewer mistakes if it's in the other mode. I think that's okay. So what is this number we're looking at? That's the heat. What that is is taking the initial energy and adding the work done and then taking away the final energy of the box to get the heat. So if I divide that by the distance, I get the force of friction. It's about 96 newtons. So you can see a summary there. If mechanical energy is conserved, then you just go kinetic plus potential equals kinetic plus potential. If work is done, then you go work equals change in energy. If heat is produced, you include the thermal or heat energy, which is force of friction times displacement, as a final quantity in the equation. So there are two parts here. One says frictional forces are present, and assignment number two says work is done. But depending, again, how you look at it, they can blend into each other. Here's what I would like you to have done for Monday, and you have about 10 minutes left here. 
I would like you to pick two or three random questions from the assignment one and two or three from assignment two and work on them and get them done for Monday. Monday we will go over any questions and then Monday will be a practice day where we finish all of these and I will have some other problems most likely for us to practice.